Thank you for joining the September 2023 VMware TAM customer webinar. This webinar is organized by the VMware TAM organization to provide our customers the opportunity to hear great content and interact directly with great speakers that are delivering it with the goal of making sure that you are getting full benefit from your software. Please make use of the Q&A feature to ask any questions. And if your question doesn't get addressed today, be sure to reach out to your TAM and ask them to follow up. Before we get into today's content, there are just a couple of announcements. Our next TAM customer webinar will be on October 12th, and we'll have the privilege of being joined by folks from the technical support and R&D teams to talk about Skyline Health Diagnostics. As I mentioned earlier, we want you to benefit from these sessions by interacting with the speaker. So if you have any questions during today's webinar, please use the Q&A feature of Zoom and we'll address them during the session. At the end of today's webinar, you'll be prompted to fill out a simple survey related to the value you received from the session and any topic suggestions for the future. Your completion of the survey is appreciated and will help us drive agendas for future sessions. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded and your TAM can make the recording link available to you. After a few months, the recording will be publicly available on the VMware TAM Services YouTube channel. That brings us to today's speaker and topic. Scott is a senior technical marketing manager in our cloud management business. Today, he'll be discussing ARIA automation config, which you may have known as salt stack config, and how you can use the tool for configuration management. Scott, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Brian. Like you said, I'm uh, with the Cloud uh, Management Business Unit. And so today I'd like to talk about uh, setting up our automation config uh, for configuration management. And so in this lesson, we'll review setting up targets, creating jobs to call state files, organizing your state files in the file server, leveraging a top state file and a high state workspace, scheduling the high state to run periodically, and applying a beacon and reactor to ensure your infrastructure is operating in a consistent state. And so at the end, you'll be able to create those jobs based on grains or targets, manage jobs, create states and leverage those in the high state and understand really the beacon and reactors and how they work. So as organizations continue to innovate with new technologies and methodologies, modern configuration management will only continue to grow in importance and impact for the organizations. So for organizations to truly harness the power of their application infrastructure, they must adopt a centralized automated approach to the configuration management. In this example, we're creating a target group for minions with the Ubuntu operating system that contains the name web. But we could also focus our grains on many other uh, grain keys. Uh, so we have like over 130 uh, keys predefined and you can define additional keys as, as well. So the one we're looking at here is the OS. So uh, any uh, machine running a, an Ubuntu based OS would be targeted that has the uh, uh, key phrase uh, web in their uh, value in their name. <clears throat> So the high state workspace here is used to manage and monitor your system's configuration. And you can see like a hierarchical view of the high state runs across the infrastructure. So you can get insights into the trends related to configuration drift uh, across your entire infrastructure. So what is the high state? Instead of manually configuring each minion and each application one by one, you can use our automation config state management to create state files that you can apply to many minions simultaneously. Keep in mind that running each state file takes time. So if you have hundreds of uh, state files and thousands of minions, a faster, more intuitive way to apply state files to the minions is to run them with this high state. When you run high state, the state that high state function is called. And that function applies um, all salt states outlined in the top state file that you create on your salt master. And we can take a look at one of those a little bit later. And so running your uh, high state can be useful in the following scenarios. Say you're setting up your infrastructure for the first time and need to standardize your configuration across all, your, all of your environment, ensuring all your database servers apply to a specific set of um, policies you define in your states or maybe web servers for that matter, right? And maybe you have uh, critical systems that 
need to remain in a specific compliance. You can schedule the highest state uh, to be run continuously so that the states defined in your top file are continuously applied to and checked against uh, the minions defined in the uh, high state workspace. And so let's uh, start just taking a look at the, the salt state files. So a state uh, definition and a state file will have an identifier followed by the name of the state module, then a function to call, the name of the state and the arguments that that state may accept. So, and we'll keep digging into this as I go on here. So, and like I was saying, as your environment grows from the initial few state files into full production use, you could find you have that overwhelming number of state files, hundreds or thousands of them. And so this is where the top state file comes into play. We can organize the state files that need to be applied using the, the grain values I was showing you earlier in the when we were creating the targets. So like my target, this middle one you can see, OS colon Ubuntu will apply to Ubuntu, where we also have OS family Red Hat, which will capture more of the Red Hat operating systems. And so this is a great way to combat and manage growth with the uh, top file and the high state execution to run all of your states against the desired uh, uh, target groups. And so here's an example of a repetitive task we've all had to do. Set the time server for a host. While we can do this manually, having a state file created to copy an NTP comp file to the target and ensure the time sync daemon is started at any stage of the machine lifecycle allows you to focus on more pressing challenges. And this could be an example of a state file that you might consider having in your top state files, just to ensure that even if a machine is changed or it has a new image and may not have a time configured, you can ensure that it's always configured the way your organization needs it. And with YAML being the default uh, language, state files can also be created in Python and JSON. And additionally, the state files are rendered on the salt minion in a decentralized model to remove bottlenecks from the salt master. So each minion will be doing the processing of the state file itself, as opposed to much of the processing load being uh, done on the master. And so here we leverage Jinja to create a variable to hold the value of the pillar, username, and password values. And that's seen up there in line one and two. And then you can see the pillar values referenced in seven and nine uh, there as well. And so here again, I just want to show a little bit more complex example. We can see the pillar data is set as a variable and then leveraged in the Jinja statements. So uh, like line five has, we can see the target ID pillar variable being uh, identified in uh, that Jinja statement there. And then also we can use Jinja to make use of if then clauses to create or update state files on a file server. And um, so, as I mentioned before, we can also write uh, state files in Python. So here's an example where we compare writing that uh, state file in Jinja and YAML to what it might look like uh, writing in, uh, the same state file in Python. Uh, so it gives your developers the flexibility to write and develop in whatever they're most comfortable with. And so next, I wanted to just kind of go over the Beacon and Reactor system. Um, ARIA Automation Config is built on this event-driven automation engine that presents or maintains a persistent two-way connection with each system under its management, allowing it to immediately detect the configuration drift and automate a response to enforce that desired state. So this powerful capability allows administrators to hedge off unwanted downstream effects and eliminate costly time-consuming troubleshooting by establishing a configuration policy and telling ARIA Automation Config to monitor and respond to any un unauthorized changes. In addition, IT teams have the freedom and flexibility to customize the response based on the nature and severity of the change. So as automated responses from uh, Config can include immediate configuration drift remediation, chat or email alerts, or the creation of a 
uh, IT service ticket so your team can work with the incident as they normally would. And so let's dig into beacons a little bit. This is a, a powerful uh, notification that the minion will trigger on that event bus and the uh, salt master can respond to. And so in this example, we've uh, set up a beacon on the minion to monitor the Apache service. And if the minion detects a change in the service, it'll send off an event on the event bus uh, since the on change only is set to true. And also we configured a delay of 30 seconds here at the bottom line there. And so if we uh, want an admin to be able to restart the service, normally an admin can restart a service in a few seconds. And so that would keep uh, the reactor from being triggered, giving the service enough time to restart. And so from the master, we can run the salt run state event command to monitor the event bus messages. And I'll um, show you that here in a moment as well. I see the one question in the chat, the, the storage for the file server. Um, that's really going to be dependent on how you deploy your file server. You can kind of make it as, as big as you need it to be. So um, the reactor service. So as part of that event-driven automation, we have the reactor component, which gives SALT the ability to trigger reactions based on event tags. And so that's what you see in that the um, top box there with reactor, SALT beacon, and then the asterisk service Apache 2. That's essentially saying, so when we see a beacon event come over for any minion, where the service is Apache 2, we want to trigger this uh, service uh, SLS state file in uh, the SALT uh, reactor environment there uh, folder. And so after defining the tag we want to respond to, we bind it to that state file I was just talking about. And a reaction could be something as simple as starting a service that may have stopped or something more complex like creating a Slack notification or that uh, incident response I was uh, mentioning earlier. And so in this example, we see that uh, if the service uh, Apache 2's running status is false, then you use service start to start it on the minion ID that was noted in the data payload. So as part of the uh, reaction or the beacon event, there's a data payload and one of the uh, properties of that payload is ID and that ID is the minions ID. So when we go to uh, run the state file to start a service, we have our target here and that target would be the ID that was received uh, as noting as uh, stopped. And so uh, instead of manually copying reactor and beacon state files, uh, configuration files, I like to create a state file and a job to push them as I make changes on the system. Uh, quick question. Uh, yes, there is a ESX uh, module um, for salts to manage uh, ESX hosts. Um, and so this approach uh, helps ensure that all of the hosts have the same config and you don't get a an admin, or even myself, I'm guilty of doing it, a copy, a reactor to one salt master, but not the other, or I testing a beacon somewhere and forget to copy it somewhere else. So I uh, tend to use this approach for ensuring that uh, my beacons and reactors are all up to date on uh, all of the desired endpoints. And so that's just a brief overview on setting up config the state files to apply them to, creating the target groups for your resources using pillar data. We didn't go too much into pillar data, but I'll show that to you here in a moment, I'm leveraging the high state uh, workspace. And so let me just drag this over here. And so this is a kind of the general layout that I like to set up or begin setting up my targets uh, grouping with. As you can see, uh, the grain criteria for many, I know from ARIA automation deployments, 
uh, that I have a custom naming profile. So my web servers all get named web for Apache and WinSer for IIS. So I configured my uh, target grouping criteria, but also we can do some more complex things with our target grouping. Like <clears throat> this one, I want all of my minions except for my salt master minion. So we can use these uh, conjunctions for and, ors, and nots to create very fine grained uh, target groups based on uh, grain data, which as we we're talking about, uh, there's over 130 built in uh, grain keys that are provided out of the box. Um, so if you're trying to find maybe a grouping of uh, desktops that you know need to be updated, maybe you're using a BIOS vendor name or uh, something along those lines uh, to find those machines to apply states to. So the target workspace is, is quite uh, powerful in its ability to uh, group your minions together. Also from here, we can look at the high state uh, runs against that uh, against the minions in that target group. And right from here, you can choose to run the high state as well. And so um, as minions check in, their keys will show up in this pending area and you have to choose to explicitly accept the key. And once it's accepted, you can see that in the accepted space here, I have a number of failed jobs because I was testing some Slack notifications on my system earlier, and uh, I was using that to test the fail conditions. And so I'll show you that here in a moment. And then the jobs workspace, it's quite powerful as well. So in here, you can see the, not only the sample built-in jobs, but some of the jobs I was talking about. And also at a quick glance, you can see what function they're applying. This one being the high state, this one being, we're going to apply a state file. And here's an example of orchestrate to send a Slack message out since I want that to run uh, locally on the master. I'm leveraging orchestrate for this. And so digging into let's say push beacons, it's as simple as saying we have a salt or salt run command. We want to target whatever target group we created. So in this case, it's my minions group that uh, happens to be excluding my salt master. And the function we're going to use is state apply. And the environment that the state file is in is called demo. Out of the box, you'll have this base and SSC environment. Um, if you've deployed with uh, ARIA suite lifecycle. <clears throat> You'll get the built-in content for config in SSE. And for this state, it's a beacon push. Additionally, you can define job inputs. So when you request the state to run, you can have the user fill in some value. And optionally, there's a area to override your pillar data, which is a great place to keep a secure data for maybe usernames or passwords uh, that you want to leverage in your uh, state file execution. So uh, I see the new environment. I'll get to that in just uh, two seconds here once I reach the file server. Actually, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and jump into the file server. So a new environment is really this right here. This, this construct of a folder is what is referred to as an environment, this root level level folder in the file server is um, just, it can be created as simply as starting a new state file. And you can say, you know, new or broad, right? And in here you can, I gotta click the drop down. And then, and then you can start creating your state file. Maybe you want to start with the top in your prod environment. And so now you can see prod created. There's a top state file. It's empty. But we could do something like 
copying the base one and begin creating a prod one that enables. Um, so this would be another state file in here. So maybe this is NTP. And then you could build out Oops, did that wrong. Yeah, click the create button. So prod, this will be my top again. So now uh, in the prod environment, any minion ID we want to apply top. And the init.sls will be the first, uh, will be the state file that's applied. And then we would populate this with our NTP configuration. Um, I hope that answers uh, the question, whoever asked that. Um, so, yep, uh, that's the, the process of creating an environment and creating folders and states inside of the environment. And so, uh, I'll leave that for now. And so we can jump back to jobs. And if we wanted, we could make a new job that applies that, or we could say, uh, actually, let me actually remove that because I would like to run the high state, but I don't wanna trigger that uh, top file I just made kind of randomly. So right, the high state workspace. Um, like I was saying before, in here you can define a number of state files uh, to run um, in one execution against your various minion target groups. Um, it's as easy as just coming in here, click run high state, decide what uh, target group to run it against. Very similar to the target uh, workspace flow of this. Maybe it's Apache. Click run high state, the job will get submitted. And it'll begin running and executing. And once it returns, we'll see in the high state workspace, success and failures. If any minion had an issue executing the top state files. And again, the activity, if anything has changed and since there's only one minion in the Apache group, we have one. And since there's the Assault Master uh, minion in the All Minions group, we have a success of two. So while running high states is powerful, what about running it on a continual basis? So that's where scheduling comes in. So with scheduling, we can create a schedule that says, you know, hourly high state. And we fortunately have a built-in job that comes with the product called high state, which will apply the high state. And again, we can choose to what target group to apply it to, whether we want to continuously apply a high state on maybe, like I was saying before, a, a system target group that requires continuous enforcement, or maybe it's a group of machines that just got deployed and you want to run a high state on them. Or maybe all minions need to have a particular high state to run continuously on them. And so you can define that here as well. Or maybe you only want to run high states on all minions once a day to create, uh, to keep from creating too much traffic. Um, whereas maybe you have a specific compliance target group that needs to run it more often. Uh, really, it's up to your business use case. And so again, you can choose to run on create as well. And so now this schedule is enabled. We can see our previous high state is finished and our new scheduled hourly high state has been queued and will begin running momentarily. And so that's that's really how easy it is to start to enable 
continuous compliance, leveraging your high states and top files. Um, yes, you can create custom grains. Yes, uh, custom grains are uh, definitely doable. Um, let's see, do I have... I don't think I have one right this second to show you. But, uh... yeah, I don't have one uh, in this environment. But yes, it is definitely uh, easy and possible to create uh, custom grains, green keys, key value pairs really to associate here. And so, yeah. Lastly is uh, pillar uh, data. I wanted to just quickly touch on. So while this is not a, uh, particularly uh, sensitive, you could have an extra item here, which is like your username and password values that you may not want um, disclosed. And Megan, you know, I, I'm uh, not too sure. Um, as I'm, it it would really just be up to scripting on uh, how you could how you would pull in your vSphere um, tags for a given uh, minion ID. Um, that's kind of the thing with the platform is with the state files being so uh, dynamic. Um, it's really up to your imagination on what you want to uh, automate. Essentially, really right. Um, so yeah, you could maybe make a rest call to vSphere, um, to get that data and then do another command to apply that grain data to the minion. Uh, but it would definitely take some, uh, some in-depth thought, but, uh, I don't see why it's not possible. Um, so yeah, the pillar data. It'd be something like this, right? And so if we go back to our file server and look at the um, DocuWiki example that's provided for us, we could see how we could start to leverage additional pillar data as variables with Jinja uh, statements just by kind of copying what's already here or updating it into your own. So then that way, if a user is not uh, found in the pillar data, it would default to user one, but also when you call this job, You could also set pillar override for, let's say, user and call it user two. And so that would cause when the state file executes, user two to be leveraged as the username instead of user one, the default in the state file, or user one, the specified user in the uh, pillar. Uh, data that we set. Um, you could also, again, you know, set a custom password here too, using the same key value pair, right? 
And so that would allow you to customize your jobs, but also you can grant specific groups and uh, users or roles access to specific jobs, thereby creating a singular state file and allowing only the group that has access to the job, the ability to set the pillar override to maybe their uh, group's desired password convention. And so let's uh, take a quick look at that as well. So we have local users, but we also support authentication for LDAP. That's really easy to set up. Uh, if you haven't, if you if you haven't deployed with Aria Suite Lifecycle and integrated with your um, IDM instance, you can of course create a standalone LDAP connection here. And this prefill defaults is really useful. It'll fill in most of the uh, values that are needed here to connect up to your uh, Active Directory instance. Um, but what I was uh, starting to go over is the ability for roles to really gate the users into what they should be able to see. Um, so if we were to create, you know, uh, finance role and we only want to get them access to run, run some commands on minions and, uh, Above that, we only want to give them access to, let's say, an Apache group, right? Or maybe they only need access to read and run the high state job. So in that way, we could create specific jobs for specific uh, roles that only each of those roles can see and leverage uh, minion overrides on. Yes, uh, Windows Server patching is uh, definitely a, a, a great use case. Um, I think uh, my colleague uh, Vincent, and I'll uh, put up the PowerPoint slide here in a minute, minute is doing a, another talk later this afternoon about uh, config and application management. And I believe he may be uh, touching on the Windows Server uh, patching uh, in uh, that talk as well. So that's gonna be at, uh, I think, uh, noon time Pacific. I don't know. Yeah. Check. Uh, 12 p.m. Pacific will be that uh, next call on automation config from uh, Vincent. And uh, I think he'll cover more on uh, the Windows Server patching there. Um, and can we get events from VMware Event Broker Appliance? Um, not that I'm aware of. I don't, uh, not, not as like a, a streaming input. Um, this, uh, the events we're talking about here are going to be on a zero MQ message bus. <clears throat> yes. Uh, so the events here are on the zero MQ uh, event bus that is configured between the salt masters and minions. And so uh, it, it would be some sort of other scripting that need to be done to connect to an event broker appliance. So I think uh, both of those were answered. And uh, so, yeah. So right, uh, leveraging roles to separate access to jobs and targets is also quite powerful, uh, giving your different organizations or business units the ability to run just what they need to run without uh, messing or touching other business units' uh, minions. And I guess one of the last things here is the master plugins workspace is a new workspace. Uh, as we release new versions, uh, sometimes it'll be needed to come in, in here and uh, update your master plugin to keep in line with the ARIA automation versions as well. 
And so speaking about that, I did want to touch on the integration between SALT and ARIA Automation. Um, with ARIA Automation, we have what's called the SALT stack resource. It's just available here on the left-hand side. Scroll down uh, past it. I don't know why I always scroll right past. There it is, right under config. So that's as easy as just dragging it onto the canvas and connecting the lines to your machine. And when it's integrated with ARIA Automation, when you're in here, you can, it'll, since it's already integrated, it already knows the inventory of the file server. And so your uh, assembler template uh, designers can simply just come in here and select a desired state file to run as part of the zero day deployment of the machine they're building. And so this can be incredibly useful because you can make your templates very generic and allow Salt to apply not only the application, but also the desired configurations in the state file at day zero. So out of the box, the machine is configured according to the salt state, and you're able to manage less templates with less complexity in them, since you don't have to set one for each application use case. Uh, and to the question earlier about uh, grain, custom grain data, this is uh, one way to specify uh, additional grain data on the machine as you deploy it. With this additional minion params, grains and roles. So the role would be the key and the web server would be the value. Now that I say that, I wonder if we do have, let's see. Yeah. I didn't deploy that machine here, so I don't have that green. But if I had deployed that, we would see role as the key and web server as the value. Yeah, for that case, you're working with uh, global support. Yeah, that'll the source of that uh, minion deployment failure will be in the minion logs. Most likely, you'll need to increase the logging level to debug for your minion, and um, then review the minion log uh, to see why the deployment has failed, um, or maybe it's a issue with uh, communication between. The salt master in the minion. Um, no, uh, it's no known issue, just uh, something to debug. Um, but uh, so, yes, uh, to that previous question, this is defining custom grains uh, at day zero when deploying from automation config or from uh, assembler. And so I guess the final thing I wanted to kind of just touch on is the more extensibility use case, which I was talking about the beacons and reactors. And so while the PowerPoint had a, my simple or, or a more simple uh, reactor, I've since been working on updating my reactor to not only trigger on beacon events, but job and runners. And so what I wanna do is if the success is false on those, I was working to put a Slack message out. So hey, notice something failed, but success is false. And so that's the generic one, but for the Apache service, I made one for that as well, right under starting Apache backup. <clears throat> I add an orchestrate Slack message, which calls this orchestration. And so since some of these uh, events have 
an ID and I want to use that ID in my message, I created a Jinja clause for uh, if it's uh, defined and not null, essentially, then do this. Else, we'll use the job ID since the other uh, job and runners have job IDs in their data payload. And then that sends out a, a simple Slack message. And so it looks like we have enough time. It won't take but a moment. I'd like to do a little demo. Uh, so here I have my, uh, oh, I have to reconnect. So with this command, this salt run state event pretty, we can monitor the event bus I was talking about earlier to see this beacons event come across. So currently we can see Apache is started and running. So let me go ahead and stop Apache, go back to watching it. And like I said, there's a 10 second, well, the example had 30 seconds. This one has a 10 second delay. So here in a few seconds, we should be, here we are, seeing the state for running is false. And it'll, here's my message. And now we can see running is true. And so what that looks like in Slack is, pull that up for you. As now I have, as you can see from that testing I was showing, you saw earlier with my failed messages, you can see, notice things were stopped, notice an activity was failed. And here we see the that ginger clause for the if then for the job ID um, or for the minion ID. And so for this run, I stopped the uh, Apache on this particular web service and we've been notified in Slack. So the team is at least aware that this machine has restarted its uh, Apache service three times today. And so that's uh, kind of my quick example on the beacons and reactors and kind of how you can start with something simple like restarting a service and begin to expand it to notifying your team and taking proactive uh, steps to remediate the issue. Um, Uh, it's pushed from the master. Uh, it's an ABX action that's uh, done in the background that talks to the master. Uh, George. So no cloud in its uh, use there. So I think that uh, just about concludes my talk. Uh, I believe we've covered uh, the basic setup, creating the state files and applying them to your targets, creating the target groups, uh, we talked about the pillar data and the pillar override in the jobs and leveraging the high state workspace. Hey, Andrew. All right. Uh, how are we seeing? Um. Yes, Andrew, it's a bit out of the scope, but generally I see tags undefined when the variable I'm trying to reference doesn't exist. Um, and so I I hit that like a lot of times with typos or maybe I've copy pasted an example and have a different, slightly different variable name. Um, so that's really what uh, I would think about, but uh, feel free to, uh, let me know offline and uh, we can take a look at that in your state file or in your reactor. I'm assuming that's a reactor state file, not a. 
uh, con file. But um, yes. So uh, if you want to get some more content, we've got a couple of really good links here. First one is our Journey to Success series. In there, uh, there's a number of bite-sized 10-minute videos that go over not only ARIA automation, but ARIA automation config and how they work together. And so I've taken a lot of the concepts I went over today and uh, made them into bite-sized uh, 10 minutes or maybe 15 minutes uh, consumable videos. And then we also have our Everything VMware ARIA web webinar series. Sorry while that truck goes by outside. It's too nice not to have my windows open. But uh, the Everything uh, VMware ARIA webinar series uh, will be on later today with uh, my colleague Vincent talking about the applications and state files and config later this afternoon. And also we have our hands-on lab for multi-cloud. Uh, there are uh, some older catalog items, but uh, a lot of the newer catalog items from this year's uh, Explore have been added to that. So if you want to check out some of this year's uh, uh, multi-cloud uh, hands-on lab items, be sure to check that link. And of course, our YouTube channel for cloud management has a lot of uh, talks and discussions by uh, me and my colleagues about config. And uh, so like I said earlier, uh, Vincent has this session at uh, noon uh, Pacific time. And uh, be sure to uh, join that. And uh, there'll be a lot of content that'll be on um, all the socials. Uh, I think it's uh, my favorite is to watch on LinkedIn, but it's on Facebook and Twitter as well, or I should say X now. So be sure to join that. And uh, thanks everyone for joining. I hope this was informative and thanks for having me. Thanks so much, Scott. This is really useful content. I really appreciate you presenting. Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of the session, this presentation was recorded, and your TAM will be able to make that recording link available to you. Uh, please join us next month when we'll be looking at Skyline Health Diagnostics. We look forward to seeing you for that session on October 12th. Thanks. <laughs>